God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The music in shopping centers just it, it drips with, with a sweetness. There is that, that scent wafting from those confectioners that makes it just all the sweeter. And sometimes, if you're not careful, when you go shopping this time of year, you, you feel like you're in one of those, those, those cheesy Christmas movies. I don't know what it is, but there's just something about this year that's, that's drawing more of my attention to these, 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 cheesy, these cheesy movies. Anyway, there's, there you are in some magical Christmas land, and there's visions of, of family and friends with, with faces beaming because of the gift that you just purchased for them at the shopping center. And you just know how much they will love this, this perfect thing that you've gotten for them. And that somehow makes this moment all the more magical. But behind all of this experience, behind this, this glitz, this, this glamour, this, this hallmarky, Christmassy kind of stuff, is marketing. The marketing of joy. They have mastered selling you not just stuff, but selling you joy. Joy can be produced, they claim, by what you do, as long as you follow the wisdom of these advertisers. Whether it's getting a puppy, that special friend of yours, or finding the newest as seen on TV gadget, they're selling you joy. But for all the joy that we're promised this time of year, uh, there are many of us who are removed from joy. The holiday season is not always as easy as it seems. In fact, for many people, it is one of the most stressful times of the year, and for a whole host of different reasons. From the morning of loved ones, this might be the first Christmas that you're going to celebrate without having them around. To being anxious over strained finances. And this is a time of giving, a time of increased spending, a time of tighter budgets. Or even uncertainty, whether that estranged family member would even respond to an invitation or not. And in the words of the great Elvis, some are expecting a new Christmas. Joy can be and often is hard to come by. Where will you find joy this year? The answer is pretty obvious, um, and no, it's not one of those cheesy movies. It's, it's here. It's right here. This season brings joy as you get to anticipate the birth of Christ. But it takes time to get the full effect of this joy. When we're tempted to to jump the gun, to, to skip over this season of Advent and get right to Christmas. But that's not how life works. The things that bring us joy are, in fact, worth the wait. The things that bring us joy don't come easily, but they often require great patience. It's like, it's like you're five, and you're watching those piles of presents grow and grow and grow and make the Christmas tree, and there you are, forced as you wait for what seems like months, distractions come, and then they rob us of, of the joy, whether it's those family stresses or finances or loneliness, and into this, this void flows sorrow. So just when joy should be flooding upon us this time of year, somehow it manages to escape us. And as elusive as joy can be, sorrow comes way too easily. But tonight, tonight I want you to see that you are just as blessed as the Magi from our New Testament or Gospel reading today, who come and they, they behold the child. They come full of joy. So rejoice with the Magi, for Christ is the answer to our sorrows. Rejoice! You do have a reason for joy this time of year. Consider everything that, that you enjoy. God provides you with what we say with daily bread, with everything that has to do with support and the needs of your body and life, and everything else that's even more than that. You don't have to get lost in those silly movies to find joy. You have all kinds of blessings around you. You have a reason for joy this holiday season. But yet, we're all too easily distracted from them, distracted from joy. And we're not alone in this distraction. In our text today, uh, King Herod got distracted. Uh, the Magi arrive in Jerusalem. They're looking for the one who has been born for the king of the Jews. And 
So here it calls together the smart people, the scribes and the teachers of the law, so they can tell him where this, this king, where Jesus, is supposed to be born. And the answer they find in an old prophet, one of those small books at the end of the Old Testament, Micah. Yeah, no. And then Micah records that the promise of the Lord is to be fulfilled in Christ, and he is supposed to be born in a small town called Bethlehem, just about five miles walk outside the city of Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. Of what generations, yeah. hundreds and thousands of years, of the faithful have been, have been longing to see what, what so many had, had spent their lives desiring now stands fulfilled. There's every reason for joy. This is it. Christ has been born. But not for Herod. Herod is distracted from this good news. Distracted from this joy. And he's distracted by power. By his love, his position as being the king of the Jews. And so he plans and he plots. And he's going to kill the Christ. To safeguard his own power. There's only going to be one king, and it's him in his own mind's eye. He is quite content with the way things are. He will not tolerate a rival to his throne. And once that, that joy departed, sorrow took a residence and found a new home. And you know what that's like, but perhaps not in quite the same way as King Herod. You have been distracted from joy, maybe by not having enough power, not having things go the way that you want them to be able to do all of the things that you would like to do. Why, oh why, can't things work out the way that I want them to just this once? Why doesn't my life work out like one of those movies that I watch? And then, and then notice what happens. When we, when we focus upon what we don't have, we lose sight of what we do have. And so our joy, which we should have, flees. Rather than rejoicing in the God who provides us with everything, our, our daily bread and with more, we get distracted and frustrated with the way things are. We, we covet more, we covet the things that others enjoy, and instead of seeing the Lord's bounty which is given to you, you see what others have, and the things that you don't have and wish to be given. And when your joy departs, sorrow all too easily comes in, your heart its new home. See, sorrow, sorrow exceeds sadness in duration and also in intensity. Sadness, sadness comes and goes. You may be sad one day or the next, but sorrow remains for an extended period of time. And the longer it stays, the harder it is, and the more it cuts deep and pierces. And so sorrow is the exact opposite of joy. Joy requires patience as you wait. Wait for the thing that you desire, whether it's waiting to graduate from school or waiting to get married, waiting for a child to be born in just a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> waiting, waiting for Christmas, whatever it is. But, but sorrow, sorrow feeds off of impatience. And so the longer that you have to go with, with waiting, the, the easier, the, the deeper the sorrow can become. Sorrow tells us that joy doesn't come from waiting that your desire must be filled right now. And so tonight, I want you to think about how, is, how has sorrow robbed you of joy over these past few weeks of Advent? However it's happened, Christ answers this sorrow simply by being who he is. He will not be the one who Herod wants him to be. He did not come to be a rival who can be so easily killed so that power can be preserved. He will not be the one who our, who our sinful selves want him to be, a, a servant who bows to our whims, who treats us like kings. No, Jesus will come as the one who he needs to be, who will be far more than we could ever want. You see who Jesus is when the Magi arrive in our text today. Matthew says that when they, when they saw the child, when they behold the child, that they fall down and they worship him. Perhaps a better translation of this would be, they prostrated themselves before him. Now, we don't use the word prostrate very much anymore. Um, what it means is they, they laid down, put their faces into the dirt before their king. Thirty years or so later, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they, they find Jesus outside the empty tomb. And what do they do? The exact same thing. Matthew uses the same words. They prostrate themselves before the risen Christ. And 
then the eleven, when they meet Jesus in Galilee and then he cooks fish for them, guess what they do? They prostrate themselves before Jesus as well. You only prostrate before God. The Magi knew it, only the two do it, the disciples do it. And what this posture does when they lay down before Christ, it reveals a great joy. The women in the tomb were just overjoyed to see Jesus resurrected. So were his disciples. This is the kind of God that you have, the kind that chooses to humble himself to be born, not in a legendary place in a palace of kings in Jerusalem, but in some lowly forgotten suburb in Bethlehem. This is the kind of king that, that chooses to die and to rise, that he would give you the things that you need, forgiveness and salvation, rather than things that you want, the things that are fleeting and fading. This is the king. The king's greatness is found in his humility. And so Matthew tells us that the Magi, they rejoiced with a great joy. That is, two joys, two, two greats. Matthew is, is making a point that they are really, 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 really excited about this. This is the God who came and took on flesh, who's, who's dying and rising again in the flesh, so that you would be forgiven, that you are now saved. So he who sages, westward faring, humbly worshipped, offsprings, offerings sharing. Why worship this child? Well, because the Lord has revealed to the Magi who this child is and why he has come. Lying helpless in a manger, poor, bare, and lowly, to set you free from all your sorrows fully. So Christmas is what? It's like what, 14 days away now, I think? Uh, we can have joy. Christmas is coming soon. We can delight in the family we will see in the presence under the tree. But most importantly, uh, we, like, like the wise men, the magi, like the faithful women, like the disciples on the shore of Galilee, we find our true joy, our lasting joy, in this child. When we behold the child, when we see Christ, we are filled with a lasting joy, as St. Peter describes. A joy that we will always have. Joy of Christ. Amen. Now may this joy which passes.